and a very happy new year to everybody. I wonder what 2006 has in store for us, but I'm quite sure it's going to be exciting. For our first programme, we're going to go to the outskirts of the solar system. The New Horizons probe is about to be launched toward Pluto. Also, very interesting news from a couple of comets. First of all, our news notes with Chris. And we begin this time, Chris, with some very good news. Yes, it couldn't be better. The European Space Agency, or rather the governments that make up the European Space Agency, yeah. including our own, yeah. have approved a new programme of solar system research called Aurora. In particular, in the early years of the next decade, the largest European lander ever to go to a different planet will touch down on the surface of Mars. It's called ExoMars, and it's going to be really exciting. Now, work starts here to work out what we want to put on the rover and to build it. Five years may seem like a long time, but it's really not for a spacecraft. We can't resist now showing you one of the best pictures ever obtained from Hubble, I think. This is the Crab Nebula. It's a supernova that blew up in 1054. Of course, it happened 6,000 years before that. But look at what it's, what it's left behind. Glowing gas in all kinds of structures that Hubble can peer right into the middle and reveal the detail. You can see it with binoculars this month. It, it's a faint misty patch, but this is the real thing. Another one, this is a planetary nebular image. Look at this. Yes, it's from the Gemini Telescope on Hawaii, and it's the twin jet nebula. You can see why it's called that. A small star, maybe the size of the sun, is buried in the centre there, and it's puffed out its outer layers and produced this marvellous structure. We are getting now amazing results from these telescopes, and more to come in 2006, that I'm quite sure. Absolutely. Chris, thank you very much. And now on to our main programme. I'm sure you remember that the Deep Impact Probe crashed into a comet Tempel-1 some time ago and produced spectacular displays, and many interesting results are coming back from there. One man who's deeply involved is Professor Mike Ahern at the University of Maryland, working for the Sky at Night. Thank you, you know, I was fascinated by that one headline. We used to be afraid of comets. Comets are now afraid of us. But there was no danger of destroying the comet, was there? No, no, there was no chance of destroying it or even changing its orbit at all. What exactly was the main purpose? The main purpose of the mission was to try to understand the difference between the surface layers of the comet and the interior. We have remote sensing observations of the surface, but we don't know how that relates to the inside. Some people won't know exactly how a comet's made up. Well, it has, since about 1950, been called a dirty snowball. Yes. It's now perhaps closer to a snowy dirt ball, yes. uh, since there's more dirt than snow, but it is basically the idea that Fred Whipple came up with in 1950 is still correct. Well, of course, Deep Impact, the probe, had been a total success. Now, I wonder whether you take us through it, Mike. Sure. We uh, launched in January of 2005, and we went halfway around the sun for six months, and then passed in front of the comet, and the comet ran over the spacecraft at 10 kilometers per second. How big was the comet? The comet has a radius of three kilometers. It's an irregular shape, but it's an average radius of three kilometers. The nucleus was, in fact, dark. Yes. If you look at a picture of the nucleus, you can see a few very bright areas. They're only somewhat brighter than the rest of it, the very brightest areas are almost as bright as a charcoal briquette. What happened when Deep Impact hit? Well, we came in very obliquely, so we tunneled underneath the surface. We vaporized part of the impactor, vaporized part of the target, and a puff of material blew its way up through the surface. That came out and moved away very rapidly. That was a small amount of material, perhaps 10 tons of material and we observed that it was very hot material. Then the rest of the material is excavated mechanically by the shock wave that went through. That came out much more slowly, and that came out very cold. Uh, the hottest material that came out later was room temperature. Most of it was perhaps, uh, oh, minus 73 centigrade. What about the crater produced? The, that's an interesting story. The crater uh, we never did see because the dust and the ice came out as all very tiny particles. We expected it to be a mix of large and small particles, but because it was all small particles, there were too, many, uh, too much cross-section, and we were never able to see through it before we flew by. We think it was 100 to 200 meters in diameter, based on a number of indirect arguments, but we don't have a picture of it. You have some of the latest images. 
I do. I do. I have a, for example, a movie made up of the uh, images taken right after the impact, and you can see a tremendous shadow as the impact happens and the ejecta come out. You see a tremendous shadow. That tells you how much material was ejected. You can't see through it at all. And uh, that's part of the reason we never saw the crater. There was just so much small material that it was a completely opaque wall. There are rays, but no clumps of material. It's just nice, uniform, smooth rays coming out. What was seen from Earth? From Earth, they saw a big increase in brightness, and they also saw large changes in the chemical composition. The uh, Earth-based observers are still working on trying to understand the uh, molecular species that they saw. Most of them are, were, were molecules that have been seen normally from comets, uh, but there are a lot of unidentified features that still have to be identified. What are the main constituents of a comet? The uh, main constituent is water. Um, after that, the main constituents that become gas that are easy to identify are methanol, which is a simple alcohol, uh, carbon dioxide. We don't can't normally observe that from Earth, but our spectrometer on board the spacecraft observed carbon dioxide, dry ice. Everything on Temple One seems to have gone perfectly. Is there anything you wanted to do but didn't? There is one thing. We did want to see the crater. That's about the only thing that we didn't do that we wanted to do. Well, this first one was a real triumph. Everything went right. Mike, yes. congratulations. Thank, Thank you. you very much. Thank you, Patrick. Let's stay now for a bit with comets. They are not all brilliant things with long tails. Some are very small and insignificant, but they've told us a great deal, and we're learning more about them because probes have been there. And one probe, Stardust, had been out to a small comet, Cometville, and is now actually on its way back. Welcome now to one of our old friends, Dr. Mark Kidger, and also Dr. Simon Green of the Open University. Well, Stardust is um, a fascinating mission. Uh, will you take us through it, Simon? Yes, well, Stardust, uh, essentially the mission had two parts to it. One was the, the flyby of Comet VIL-2, which was uh, the closest distance, at least the one which we know precisely, um, at 200 and, about 240 kilometres from the, the, this nucleus, a few kilometres across. Um, but going that close, you, you the put the spacecraft in great danger, and it's precisely that great danger is the thing you need, because you want to collect the dust particles that are emanating from the comet coming off with the evaporating ices. We had a, a, a sensor on one half of the front shield in front of the main part of the spacecraft. And we also had a second sensor on the shield behind. There were about five layers of shields between the impacting particles and the sensitive parts of the spacecraft. And one centimetre particle would have gone through all of them. Uh, we had seven particles that went through the thickest first shield and they were at least a millimeter in size and we estimate the largest one on the spacecraft as a whole based on our information uh, was four millimeters in size so getting very close yes. to that critical size but of course it's not what's hitting the spacecraft that counts it's what's hitting this collector yes, indeed. to uh, come back to the earth which is the second phase of the mission and that collector you might think of as a, a large tennis racket containing uh, between the strings essentially containing glass, but not just ordinary glass. This is very, very low density, spongy, porous glass. And the idea of this is to slow the particles down from their flyby speed of about six kilometers a second without heating them up. And that's the key thing. We want to bring back these dust particles as unaltered as we can so we can study their composition and structure in the laboratory. When's it due back? Uh, 15th of January, uh, about 3 o'clock in the morning, uh, Pacific time, and it's going to land in the desert near in Utah and um, hopefully be, be, uh, come down softly on a parachute. Therefore, the landing procedure is not the same as it was with Genesis? Uh, not quite the same. Uh, with Genesis, there was a, a stunt helicopter to catch the, uh, the parachute as it came down. With the case of Stardust, it will just land on the ground, but we hope what will happen is the parachute will open. Uh, and then the, uh, the probe will be searched for after it's landed. We've got results already from the results of the flyby. What did we learn from that? It was a surprise to me because we had a feeling that VIL-2 would have an old surface. It had a close encounter with Jupiter in, in the 70s, um, so it's only had a few passages close to the Sun, and we thought the surface would be battered with craters and telling us something about its early history out in the outer solar system. Um, it certainly doesn't look like that at all. Now, one thing strikes me, though. We've now seen various comets in close-up, beginning with Halley, and now in the and these comets are not all the same. They're quite different. 
I'm afraid that's true. That's absolutely, totally different. In fact, going to the example of Built 2, even the two faces of Built 2 are completely different. And if you put together the photographs of the four cometary nuclei that we've seen, Halley, Built 2, Borelli, and the latest one, Temple 1, really it's very hard to believe that they're the same kind of object. Which one is the real comet? The kind of processes that we presume have shaped uh, the surface of comets since their, their formation are early on, when they're in the outer solar system, they'll be bombarded by uh, galactic cosmic rays and ultraviolet radiation, which would process, chemically process the ices on the surface and maybe redden and darken them, and of course collisions in their source region. And so we would expect the surface to be covered with craters, maybe with frosts where material has come from a crater and then recondensed on the surface. Um, and then later on in the history, if they come into the inner solar system, they may have had a close approach to a planet, been tidally disrupted and re-aggregated, so seeing um, the evidence of a rubble pile formation. And then when they get close to the sun, we should see the evidence of, of heating on the surface and successive layers being removed. So all those competing processes could potentially make what was initially a series of comets look very similar, look very different at the time we, we can observe them. We've heard a great deal about organic materials and comets. Well, organics, people associate that with life. Yes, because organic material contains carbon, and carbon is the, the essential part of, of uh, organic living material, if you like. Um, but, of course, that doesn't mean there's living material no, no. in the comets. Definitely um, not. But they may contain the very earliest building blocks for the material that eventually went up to make life on the Earth, and maybe elsewhere, too. So let's turn now to the outer part of the solar system and the departure of New Horizons for Pluto. Mark... Can you take us through the New Horizons program? Yes, th it's, this is going to be absolutely momentous here. I wish Simon the very best of luck with Stardust, but uh, the mission to Pluto is really something very new because it's the one part of the solar system we haven't explored. It will make a flyby of Jupiter in February or March 2007 and then swing off to Pluto. Now, the idea is to arrive in, at Pluto in 2015, summer 2015, and to investigate Pluto and Charon very carefully. It's got seven science instruments on board. There are a whole series of aims, but for many people, the biggest one is to look at the atmosphere. Now, this atmosphere of Pluto that appeared when Pluto was at perihelion is behaving in a most peculiar manner. People expected it to, to freeze out, to freeze down onto the surface, disappear. It's still there, and in fact, it's actually warmer now than it was a few years ago, which has been an amazing result. Nobody quite understands why. We've got to understand now that, of course, Pluto has a very eccentric orbit. At perihelion, as it was in 1988, it's actually closer in than Neptune, but at aphelion, it goes much further out, of course, it gets very much colder. Exactly, and Pluto, to a large degree, does behave exactly like a comet. That when it gets close into the sun, it develops this atmosphere, the surface methane ice sublimes, forms an atmosphere that's reasonably dense, and then it freezes out again as it goes away from the sun. Now, we expected this to have happened long ago. Now, people are hoping the atmosphere will still be there in 2015 when New Horizons arrives. Even if it isn't, they want to study the surface, map the geology, what kind of object is Pluto, really? Uh, because it is a most peculiar, unusual object. Just how similar is it to other bodies of the Kuiper belt? Just in case some people don't know, Pluto is actually much smaller than our moon, much smaller than any planet, and Charon the satellite is half the diameter of Pluto, so I think it's, it's really a double body. Yes, exactly. In Pluto and Charon, uh, the, the difference in mass is only a factor of about six. The next smallest in the solar system is the Earth and Moon. The Moon uh, is 81 times less massive than the Earth. And after that, you have to go to, to Jupiter. And Jupiter, it's 3,600 times Ganymede. So really, the Pluto and Charon is a quite exceptional body. It's a very peculiar system. Pluto is not the only traveler in those remote parts of the solar system. There are others. Long ago, first Kenneth Edgeworth and then Gerard Kuiper, suggested there might be bodies of small objects out there, and they do exist, making up now what we call the Kuiper Belt, and Pluto is the largest member of that belt. Yes, and that belt is actually much more extensive than uh, the asteroid belt in the inner solar system, and the bodies are potentially much, much bigger. 
And Pluto is just one large example of, of many hundreds of thousands of bodies that we should be able to detect. Not even the largest? Not even the largest anymore, no. There's one body which is, has already been detected which is larger and there must be many more lurking out there. And uh, are they like Pluto, I wonder? That's a very good question. People looked at Pluto and said, Pluto's got a satellite, that makes it different. But now, in fact, there are about 10 objects that have been detected so far that have satellites as well. Pluto now has three satellites, of course, with the two very small satellites that have just been discovered. However, one of the very large Kuiper Belt objects that was discovered just recently, 2003 EL61, also has two satellites. Uh, one quite large one that was detected uh, very quickly, and a, a smaller one has just been detected as well. So Pluto isn't even un unique in having multiple satellites. Uh, and that, that has been a very big surprise, the fact that so many of these objects do appear to be double or, or even triple bodies. When will the New Horizons fly past Pluto? Well, it should reach Pluto and the Kuiper Belt in uh, summer 2015, if we're lucky. Now, there is a possibility yeah. that if the launch is delayed, uh, it could miss its Jupiter flyby and it will arrive much later. The plan at the moment, everything seems to be going well with the mission, is to reach Pluto and, and Charon, do a good mapping of the surface, the geology, investigate the ring system, if there is a ring system, and any small satellites that may exist, and then it's going to go off into the Kuiper Belt, and in the following years, the idea is for it to go to several Kuiper Belt objects and have a look at various bodies that are smaller than Pluto and see what the similarities and differences are. Now that is going to be fascinating. Now let me come now last to one, one naughty problem. I'll put this to both of you. I've got my own ideas here. We always regard Pluto as the ninth planet. But is Pluto a planet? What do you think, sir? Um, I think it isn't a planet. I think it's just one of the larger Kuiper Belt objects. But um, given the history of the nomenclature and um, we've all grown up being used to thinking of Pluto as a planet and I think we shouldn't change that but we shouldn't name any more. We'll mm -hmm. have not only planet 10, planet 11, planet 12, planet 13 very very quickly. So I think it's not a planet. What do you think Mark? Well, I remember in 1979, you sent me this as an exam question in Queen Mary College. <laughs> I said, yes, it was a planet, and I was wrong. It is not a planet. Uh, I, I'm not as optimistic as Simon. I think that uh, many more of these objects larger than Pluto, and it's going to be very, very difficult to maintain the fiction that uh, Pluto should be kept as a planet. It isn't, I'm afraid. It is not a planet. I'll nail my colours to the flag. I'm talking about planets in our own solar system. And I would define a planet here as uh, being a spherical object going around the Sun and as large as or larger than Mercury, which is just over 3,000 miles across. I think you'd find, Patrick, that quite a lot of people would be sympathetic with that view. <laughs> anyway. Pluto is there, planet, KB or not, it's a fascinating world. Mark, Simon, thank you very much. Well, it's uh, newsletter time. If you want your newsletter, then send your stamped address envelope to the following address. Sky at Night, Newsletter 100, BBC Birmingham, the mailbox, B11RF. And uh, when I come back next month, I'll be going with Chris to the top of Mauna Kea in Hawaii, to visit one of the world's really great observatories. So until then, good night.